Okay, picture this. You book some vacation time with your family, and you're going to go skiing at a posh resort in the French Alps. So not only do you have lots of money, but you've taken those you love to a place that should provide great memories for all of you. And then during a break from sliding down big hills, you go for lunch, and your beverage of choice is coffee. And then nothing bad happens. <laughs> you just wolf down your meal, you drink your cup of the good stuff, then you go back to skiing. That might make for a very dull movie, but it does allow me to segue into a promotion of our sponsor. Of course, you couldn't be over in France and order spark plug coffee, but you can order it over here and take it over there. And you just might want to, because as good as I'm sure the grounds are at that resort, Sparkplug offers the freshest, fairly traded, premium Arabica beans in this enormous resort we call the country of Canada. They've got a whack of blends and roasts, including rotating seasonal blends. You can also get half-calf or decaf in case pounding back the full calf makes you jittery enough that you deny reality or later weep in public. Sparkplug will ugly cry. Sparkplug will send packages to customers in the United States and Canada within a week. Canadians like us will even get free shipping. But how about committing to a membership? One of those gets you perks and deals that you'll love, and you'll save money on every order. And you can customize your membership to get orders when it suits your life. That way, if your marriage is going up in smoke, just because of that one time you were a coward, maybe you'll want to pause your Sparkplug membership, and they'll let you. Or cancel. This is so very much not a Coffee of the Month Club. Once the dust settles over this marital conflict, you should sit down and type sparkplug.coffee into your computer or your handheld device. Want to save 20% off your next order? Then use our H-Y-E-S promo code. So the truly best place to go is sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S. All right, now that we've railed on you plenty for flighting and then fighting with your wife, we should start discussing the movie where those things happen. Bev, let the maestro know we need his music to play right now. And action! Have you ever seen... Force Majeure. Bonjour and tac for taking part in the 562nd episode of this Classic Movies podcast we started calling Have You Ever Seen just over a year ago. Before that, we were the Top 100 Project. We review and we spoil movies from a ways back every Monday and every other Friday, which is when I talk about stuff on my own. And I am your host, the guy who doesn't like snow, isn't all that gunned about skiing, and couldn't possibly afford to pay for four people to go to a resort... Ryan Ellis. And here's the lady who likes her wine, but would never want to be left behind to look after two kids on her own. <laughs> My wife, Bev. That is me. <laughs> A lot of nutshell thoughts. That was one I had earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> this poor, poor woman. Let's take care of these two kids on her own. <laughs> Even for only a few seconds. Okay, the coming attractions opinion question for Force Majeure plays into that. Have you ever been in a life or death situation, panicked, obviously lived to tell the tale, and felt guilty later about how you handled it. I have. So when I was 19, me and my boyfriend were in a car accident. I had been in a car accident about a year prior. It was a fender bender. Somebody rear-ended me, and I had whiplash, and I had to deal with all the car insurance and going to the chiropractor and all the things that come with that. And it had been less than a year since that car wreck, and then somebody ran a red light and T-boned us. On the passenger side, and I remember my first instinct was all I could think about was, oh my God, I'm going to have to go through that whole ordeal all over again. And I was swearing, I was spitting mad. And then my boyfriend turns to me and with this look of real genuine concern goes, are you okay? At that moment, it dawned on me. The last thing I was thinking about was if he was okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was fine. I like lived with some guilt about that involuntary reaction. And I hope you have a nice vulnerable story to tell me because I don't know if I've ever told you that story before. Don't recall hearing it. Yeah. I understand that instinct because clearly he wasn't bleeding and he didn't seem like he, I guess. I, I wouldn't there. have known if he was. You're I didn't that, look. Yeah. Didn't even cross my mind. That's very relatable. And you had tunnel vision, so I get it. I was 19. I You're also a child, yeah. I mean, all these caveats, but it still is by kind of like revealing thing about myself. The main character in this movie is a lot older than that, and I'm older. You're being so nice to me. <laughs> well, here's my answer. Okay. Answers. I don't think I've ever actually faced life or death, but I'll be honest. I don't know I wouldn't react the wrong way if an avalanche was coming at us. I'd like to think I would risk my own life to save yours, 
But it's easy to say that in calm conditions when I'm not faced with that danger. So many people do that. I would never bail on my wife or my friend or my mom or whoever. Easy to say that when we're just talking about it when nothing's a problem. I might panic or freeze or do nothing. I always think about when we took Sam to the Toronto Islands and Fox too, but Sam's Sam is the dog. story here. Yeah, we had just gotten him. He got in a pit bull's face and probably would have been ripped to pieces if the pit bull didn't just pin him to the ground like a bouncer. We thought the pit bull was eating him, basically. We thought he was dead because the pit bull did pin him by the neck with her jaw. I was like, calm down. It's going to be cool. Well, that's what she was doing. She was just like, chill out, buddy. She didn't hurt him at all. She was a perfect lady. He started the fight, but she was not on leash. Also true. Yeah. yeah but regardless, we, we thought he was stood dead. There, we both stood there frozen. If she's got him, she's got him. There's nothing we can do about it now. And trying to break up this fight is just going to get one of us hurt too. It's not like I should have dove in there and gotten bitten by either of them. Plus, Sam was new to us, and I didn't have that instinct of, "Oh my God, my baby." Maybe I would have for Fox. I don't know. But in any case, it was an eye opener. I hope I would do the right thing for you during an emergency and not run away to save my own skin. But I can't promise I wouldn't turn into cowardly Ryan. If I were king of the forest. <laughs> I just don't think I'd lie about my actions afterwards. That I can agree with you. I don't know how you would react. I'd like to hope that you would react the correct way. But then every situation is different. And what is the right way? I do agree with you that you would never try to gaslight me and lie to me and manipulate me into dropping it or pretending it never happened the way that Tomas does in this movie. My favorite thing about when he runs away in that avalanche, and it is just the, not even mist, but the snow residue, if you will, that comes over them. But it's convincing. It looks like like they're about to get wiped out by snow, all of them. And everybody runs away. It's not just him. I guess she doesn't with the kids because they're frozen in fear. But I love how he's pushing past the guy, almost like he barrels him over. And you hadn't seen it before. I showed you the clip of George Costanza on Seinfeld. <laughs> Fire! <laughs> knocks over a clown. Knocks over an old lady. Knocks over kids to get out of that apartment because of a fire. So similar to this. I'll be honest, a lot of people wouldn't do that. A lot of guys especially. I would stand up for my lady and my friends and I'd save the day. I think a lot of people think that about themselves. Want to think that. Certainly want others to think that about themselves. I was watching this interview with Ruben Ostlund. Is that how it's said? I think it's Ostlund. Ostlund. He said one of the inspirations for making this movie was that he had been interested in shipwrecks. And actually, Matz talks about the Estonia, this ferry that went down and all these people died. And he discovered a statistic, two things that were interesting. One, couples who are in hijacked planes, the divorce rate skyrockets in this crazy rate. A lot of couples who've been in a dangerous situation like that divorce. The most likely people to survive those shipwrecks, which include the Estonia and the Titanic, no matter what people say happened during those disasters, if you were a young man, you were more likely than anyone else to survive. When stories are told about these shipwrecks, they tell stories of these brave men who let women and children go first, but that's not the actual fact. The fact is that human nature plus a physical advantage makes people save their own skins no matter yeah. what they think they would do and what they say they would do. I was at a softball tournament a long time ago. I've mentioned this team before, I think. Mostly black and Asian players, so I'm a minority, and that's cool. My friend Dave ran the team, black guy. We knew an opponent in the tournament who was there as well, and we were in the parking lot between games. We see some kind of fracas. Fracas? <laughs> White guys were bothering Asian guys. Dave was leading the way, but I saw this too. Want to stand up for him. And I remember thinking, I think I have this right, that, okay, my first fight ever is for a guy I barely know because I'm backing up Dave. Because it was a racial thing. I don't know what the guy said, the white guy said to the Asian guy. So my instinct there was to back up my friend. But I come back to Sam, which is, this dog's going to die, and I didn't even move. You couldn't have saved him. If that dog was going to kill Sam, there's nothing you could have done. Might have been moment. instant. Might have been, grabs his neck, shakes him once, and he's dead. There's nothing you can do to loosen the grip of a pit bull's jaw. All you can do is raise the risk of them turning on you as well. We were bracing ourselves to watch an absolute tragedy in front of us, but didn't go down like that because that dog was good. But I still think you did the right thing that day. That wasn't an act of And not doing anything. Yeah. yeah. And I just watched Straw Dogs again. It was on YouTube. And I was thinking about watching it. There it was, free on YouTube. There's an example of a guy who, before the ending, doesn't do anything to these guys who are doing all of the things that they are. What are you going to do? You're outnumbered. There's that scene where he's driving to town and they wave him on, go past us. And as soon as he does, he almost gets wiped out by a car coming the other way because they deliberately did that 
maybe he would get hit and run over by this, I think, a big truck or something like that. Okay, so let's say that they, and they don't in the movie, but they all pull over. Why would you do that to me? He loses if they get in a big brawl. It's three of them. They're all bigger than he is. you got to use your head, too. So That's also another that. good movie about masculinity, where in the end, he indulges the violent side of himself and really becomes like a different person. Okay, Act of God was released, or actually, I guess, Tourist, you could say, because that is the Swedish, Swedish title. Yeah. Tourist without the O. But Act of God is what Force Majeure, I've always thought, meant. It was released in Sweden 10 years ago in mid-August 2014. It went to a zillion film festivals and came out in this part of the world later that fall. It wasn't a sleeper hit or anything, but did wind up breaking in over four million bucks worldwide. But Bev, since this wasn't a global phenomenon or anything, people could probably use a refresher on the plot. So give us a skinny on Force Majeure. It is a pretty skinny skinny. An upper-class Swedish family's vacation to a luxury ski resort in the French Alps is ruined when a close call with an avalanche reveals the father, Tomas, to be a coward who abandons his wife, Ebba, and their two kids. Not that he's about to admit it. Tension mounts as their vacation continues and the family come to terms with the ugly truth that was revealed to them. Or, in a nutshell, paying good money to frolic in the snow ruins attractive couples' marriage. (laughs) <laughs> don't go in the snow it's just a bad idea in general we're canadians we know snow is bad not this year we barely had any so far on january yeah. the fourth we record thank this. you el nino or other nutshell run away run away <laughs> one of my favorite quotes from the monty python movies especially of course well i guess it's mostly if not only in the holy grail the rotten tomatoes numbers on force majeure are really good 93 percent of critics like this film 7.9 out of 10 is the average there are 166 reviews on the site and 76% of audiences. The 2020 Will Ferrell and Julia Louis-Dreyfus remake, which is the second last movie I saw on the big screen before the pandemic shut down theaters, because the last movie I saw was Invisible Man with you. But I saw Downhill Alone. I thought it was all right, I guess. But the Rotten Tomatoes numbers are bad. 36% and 14% from the audiences. Force Majeure was 200th at the 2014 U.S. box office. The Grand Budapest Hotel was number 54. And Birdman, the Best Picture winner, was number 78. And I'm guessing you think this should have been with those two in the Best Picture race. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I can't remember. It was nominated for Foreign Language. It didn't win, though, did it? They got no Oscar nominations at all. Oh, my Martin for Foreign Language film. God! It could be that Sweden thought some other film should have been nominated. Because that's what happens sometimes. You'll think, why wasn't this a nominee for Best... Of course, that was called then Foreign Language Film. Now it's Best International Feature. But it's sometimes because France or Sweden or Japan or wherever the country is nominate something else because they think they're going to win for that one instead. And maybe that doesn't even get recognized as one of the five. Considering it was such a darling at all the festivals, I'm really surprised. This was up for the BAFTA for foreign language film, and it won Un Sutton Regard, the jury prize at 2014's Cannes Film Festival. He won the Golden Lion for The Square, his follow-up to this. Right? Well, the Palm Door. If you're talking the about Palm Door, Palm sorry. Film Festival. Yeah. I don't know about the Berlin Film Festival. Ruben Ostlin won, well, the movie did, but he wins the award. It's always to the director at that festival. So he won the Palm Door for The Square and for Triangle of Sadness. And I would say this is a better movie than those two movies. I recommend both of them, with caveats, especially for Triangle of Sadness, which is <laughs> one of the grossest movies I've ever seen. At least there was a reason for them to puke, because so many movies... Oh my god, I'm upset. Vomit versus these people have a reason to vomit. It was there a reason for us to swim in the vomit with them for as long as we did? No, no. but my problem has always been, oh my god, my dad died, I puke. Come on, you don't do that. I like this movie too, actually. I think I like it a lot more this time. Not that I didn't like it the first time I saw the movie. I know you've always been a huge fan, and this is the second movie in the month of Bev, so tell us what you think about Force Majeure. Yeah, I love this movie. I put it on my list of the best films of the decade that we recorded back in 2019. I love Ruben Ostlund. Ostlund? Ostlund. He'd already told me once. Ostlund. He has his weaknesses, but I adore the way that he can just laser focus on the bleakest aspects of human nature and not let us look away. He has this great knack for the balance between the sheer horror of it and the mirror he's holding up to us that makes everybody a little uncomfortable and that pitch-perfect black comedy that he's so good at. I think what makes Force Majeure special is the way it subverts our expectations. The first time I saw it, I thought, I know where this movie is going. Look, this guy just abandoned his family. He ran to safety. The rest of this movie is going to be about the catharsis of watching his downfall for this failure and watching his wife get the upper hand over him. And it starts out that way until a point where the film invites you to have sympathy for this pathetic man 
The tables turned and I found myself questioning why I should be so eager to condemn him. So it's as compassionate as it is cruel. I don't know if you had the same viewing experience. Because I imagine this movie probably can read completely different to a man who's watching it or a woman who's watching it. In the good way. If you have a fragile marriage, maybe it wouldn't be a good idea to go see this movie. Especially if there's any kind of cowardice or something like that. Because either partner could say, well, look at that. We've been watching this for two hours. I know what that feels like. I think beyond the doubts you might have about your partner, the movie invites you to examine the way we just accept the roles that we're given in society as a man, as a woman. This is like a nuclear family. They are following all the things they were told to do from the time they were little kids, socialized probably in a very similar way that we were socialized to expect men and women to have this role or that role and the ways that those expectations sell us out and come up short and can lead you to a moment of massive disillusionment from just this one incident. You know, when I watch Ebba, it's not just a woman realizing that her husband didn't come through for her. It's a woman re-examining her entire marriage and thinking about all the ways that he's let her down and suddenly not able to forgive him or look the other way anymore because this one incident pushed her over the edge. And when you look at Tomas, he's a man who's been lying to himself probably his whole life mm. and convincing himself that he's actually doing a great job as a man, as a husband, as a father, even though as he admits to Ebba in his big cry moment, which <laughs> should be cathartic, but it is not. It's funny. <laughs> it's funny. It never stops being painful. You think that it would give you this moment of relief, but instead it's something different. And again, so smart to subvert our expectations like that. But he admits that he's been unfaithful to her. He admits that. That's thrown off, by the way, the unfaithfulness. Because she already knew. He says, uh, oh, I'm unfaithful, and then I confess to you. Oh, I cheat when I'm playing right. games with the kids. She already knows all these things. And that's why I say she's a woman coming to terms with what she already knows about him. And when you say a fragile marriage, probably shouldn't see this movie. I was watching this interview with Ostland, and he said, jokingly, he's like, one of his goals with the film was to see the divorce rate in Sweden spike. He's divorced. Oh, is he really? I believe before this movie came out. Well, there you go. I think I saw he that. He knows a thing or two about the fragility of marriage. Well, I don't know if Tomas, Johannes Kunki, <laughs> that's the hardest name to pronounce in this entire cast, I think. I'll stick with Tomas from this point on. <laughs> the actor who portrays Tomas. <laughs> but him groveling like that for her, weeping like that in a way that most man, woman, child would never do, maybe could save the marriage. Because he is at least being honest. And it's not a matter of him pulling, as he had been, a bit of a tough guy routine before that. And also being flat or dishonest, saying that perception's wrong. And when she shows the video to Mats and Fanny, we now see he was recording it on his phone. And then why is the phone running away? Because you're carrying it. Because you're running away. You can't run away in snow boots. Another nutshell I had for this was, well, twice in the movie, they prove you can. First, the son runs away when they're about to get on the, whatever, the subway type thing there. You and mom are going to get divorced. And the son runs onto the little train thing, runs in snow boots. And then at the end, when Tomas saves Ebba, saves, quote unquote, she pretends she needs to be saved. He runs in his snow boots. But he says to her, you can't run in snow boots. It's impossible. She just laughs at his face then. Tomas has this great emotional journey. She does too. His is more dramatic. This man is truly experiencing an ego death right in front of us. He has been tested and he has failed. And then his first strategy is to just bury it deep down, forget that it ever happened. And I think when he's lying to Ebba, he's also lying to himself. Yeah. But she just won't play along. She is not going to let him. So next he just straight gaslights her, right? Textbook gaslighting. Though we kind of sympathize because we know he's just terrified of confronting what he did. But it is super manipulative. And then when Ebba has him dead to rights with the video, he's still up to his tricks. He avoids. And when that doesn't work, here come the waterworks. And this moment in the film is so important to me because he's sitting outside the door and he's got his face in his hands and he's crying. And she laughs and she's like, you're not crying. Mm -hmm. You're faking it. And he's like, busted. He's definitely done this before. This is definitely uh, okay. in his bag of tricks. And ironically, that's public. Nobody else is in the hallway. Well, that janitor dude is a few different times in the movie. And the one time they pull their we're rich routine, give us some privacy. I can understand the notion that they want privacy. He's but straight up you're staring the ones. Well, he's what? He's straight up staring at them. Yeah, true. But they're the ones who are making a scene in public. They're in the hallway of this place. Every time they go out in the hallway to talk, there's never anybody else there except for 
the janitor sometimes watching them. But he's more right than they are. He could give them their privacy, but he's doing his job. Well, he isn't right at that moment. He's no, having a smoke. Just... But he's in the process of doing his job, and they don't need to be out there. They want the privacy because they want to be away from the kids. But if you want to walk in the hallway, anybody could walk by. And if you had some kind of fight, whatever it is, physical or emotional, and somebody sees that, that's on you. Chances are pretty slim he can understand a word they're saying, too, because he's French and they're Swedish. I should think I read she's, she's Norwegian. Norwegian. Yeah. There are five languages in this movie. There's Swedish, French, Norwegian, English, and Italian. How do they teach languages in Europe? It blows my mind all the time. But a little aside about the actor who plays the janitor. Oslind wanted a working class character to kind of be silently judging them. Almost like a comedy note, but also a reminder. There's many reminders about the privilege that they're living in, in this luxury hotel. And he cast this guy from a pizza place. He was working at a pizza place and he just loved his look. And he loved that he had this laid back attitude. And he cast him right then and there. So, back to the crying. We see he's fake crying. I don't think I caught on to this the first time I saw the movie. And I think this is probably open to interpretation because so few things are said outright in the film for us to know for sure. But as I said to you, I think, oh, he's done this before. He's fake cried to her before. And I think he's done all of these things before. He's not a good husband. He's not a good man, really. He has all these manipulative tactics that he uses to get away with it. And at this point, you see how well his manipulation tactics have worked on Ebba up until this point and how much she's totally aware of what he's doing. I have been in a relationship like this. I had this ex-boyfriend who wasn't evil. Oh, he you're wasn't not currently, abusive. okay. No, no, not you. Oh my God, no, imagine. My ex-boyfriend. I'm a bad liar. <laughs> you are a terrible liar. You are a terrible liar. It's actually kind of reassuring sometimes. So my ex wasn't evil. He wasn't abusive. He just didn't have many scruples when it came to getting what he wanted and doing whatever he wanted to do whenever he wanted to do it. And I knew when he was manipulating me, but it was just too exhausting and pointless to call him out on it. It was always easier to give in. That is, until it wasn't, and I left him, but we didn't have kids, so a totally different dynamic. Yeah, that's true. I was never married to him. We didn't have kids. You weren't rich, too, and this guy clearly makes a lot of money. And I don't think she works. I don't get the impression that she has a job of her own. I think she just looks after the kids. She's a full-time parent. Okay. So Tomas, on top of coming to terms with his own failures as a man and a father and a person in general, has to cope with the fear that he might seriously lose his wife this time. He's always gotten away with it before. He knows this time is different. What happens next is he has the big cry, which is a real cry. I'm not saying it's not real, but I'm saying, do you think he's being manipulated? Well, hold on here. So we said the big cry. I'm always picturing the one where he's... I think it's just outside the room. Maybe it's around the corner. But he's sitting on the ground. Yeah. That's what you're talking about now. So first he fakes it. But where did he fake it? Outside the hallway then too? Well, it's the same seat. So first he's faking okay, it. Okay, you mean the same scene. And she right. calls him out on it. And he's like, fine. And then he goes, okay, what do you want me to do? You think I don't feel like a piece of shit? I know I'm a bad person. And this is when he says, I cheat on you. I cheat on games with the okay. kids. I lie to you. I do all these things. And as he's saying this, the real cry starts. I do believe it's sincere, but then he just really lets it go. Mm. And she is a very controlled woman. She's clearly filled with rage. You never see many emotions cross her face. She keeps it tightly wound. Yeah. But he has this huge, vulnerable, messy, embarrassing Which the cry, kids hear. Which the kids hear. They're in the hallway. It's completely public. She finally gets him to go in. I think they forgot their key. They have to bang for the kids to let them in. And then he's crying in the room in front of the kids, yeah. which is something she would never, ever do. She's always really trying to protect the kids. And gets the kids involved. They're screaming at her eventually. Why aren't you comforting daddy? Get over yeah. here. And he doesn't care how his behavior is affecting them. He's coming in for hugs, getting comfort from them. And they're young. I question if this is appropriate behavior with children. I'm sure different parents would have different philosophies. What if the but context... there's an argument to be made that this is a bad thing to do in front of your children, to fall apart like that. What if the context was different and it was some kind of death in the family and the person fell apart this way? Maybe the father died or a brother died and he acted the exact same way. We're supposed to be this kind of society that says men should be able to cry in front of people. Maybe not fall apart completely, but if you're going to be told it's okay to cry, well, then you can't control how you cry. I know that's not what this is, but I'm just mm -hmm. making that question. It's been 10 years since the movie came out, and the world has changed a lot in 10 yes. years, especially when it comes to what men are supposed to be like, including showing emotion. Our nephew talks about the way he is with his friends, that they're much more touchy-feely, they're much more open with their emotions. They behave in ways that men, when you were his age, would 
never. Even Fanny, who's our representative young person in this movie, she's Matt's 20-year-old girlfriend, talks about how her generation is different from their generation. There's like a 15-year age difference there. And so it could be a generational thing that he shouldn't be this shy. Maybe Harry will grow up and be more open with his emotions and his vulnerabilities than Tomas ever would be because Tomas is opening up and being vulnerable and exposing his flaws and weaknesses to him Mm -hmm. instead of trying to pretend to be somebody he's not. I honestly don't have the answer to this, if it's good or bad. I know Eva thinks it's bad. Yeah. But she also, in that scene, turns around. She's calling him out. The tension is building and building and building in this film. And I don't think there's a catharsis in this scene. But I do think she makes a decision. I don't think she's happy with her decision. But she loves her kids. And they're distressed. She wants the lifestyle they have back home. She wants things to go back they're to normal. They're wealthy. It's either the next scene or very shortly after is the scene where's their last ski day, Mm -hmm. and they're on the hill where there's no other skiers around, and there's a total whiteout conditions. They shouldn't do it. They should not be be fine. But they're up there, so it's like, okay, one more run. We can just do this slowly and be safe. She pretends that she wipes out. And not only... And gets lost. Does she pretend, but he's pretending too. They plan this in advance, and I'll tell you why. Okay. She's missing. They stop. They're like, where'd she go? They hear her in the distance calling for help. He's like, stay here, kids. I'm going to go get her. And he comes back carrying her. Right. Puts her down, and she immediately dusts herself right. off. <laughs> she needs goes, to be carried. Goes to get her own skis yeah. in the same place that they just came from. Like a joke. It's Why a joke. is he in on that? Because I thought that was just her. Because she dusts herself up and goes back up the hill, and he doesn't react at all. He's just sitting there smiling. They're putting on a show for the kids. And they uh-huh. agree to it ahead of time. It's my... That's interesting because I'm thinking that she was doing that for his sake and for their sake. But you're saying it's just for theirs. Yeah. But then here's well, the best thing. For his sake too. Doesn't he feel great? Look well, at the Giant smile. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But one of the best things in the movie, maybe the best thing in the whole movie, is that she does the same thing at the end when the bus driver is doing a bad job of driving them to the airport down a, not even that windy a road. He's a bad driver, clearly. She demands to get off. Not making sure the kids come with her. Now, I wonder when I saw the movie the first time, and a little bit this time too, but especially the first time, is this a test? And that's why she's doing this. She's testing him now with this fake, I'm hurt or I'm needing help, so come get me. But now she's doing it again to see how he reacts. And ironically, it's Matt's, his friend, who's the one that takes charge in the bus. Not that it had to be Tomas that did, but everybody's panicking. We gotta get off the bus right now. Oh, trample everybody. Hey, guys. So... Christopher Hivju from Game of Thrones, Tormund uh, Giantsbane. Tormund Giantsbane <laughs> forever. He's the one that calms everybody down. But Tomas doesn't bail on the kids, and neither does Matt's or Fanny or anybody else. In fact, their friend stays on the bus, the only one that does. Charlotte, we haven't talked about her yet, but she's the only one that stays on. But that's what's so great about this film, and why I like it a lot more this time, is that I'm watching this knowing that it was going that way. I didn't the first time, of course. But she proves to be a coward, too, unless that was a setup. And I don't know why that would be a setup. I think she just panics like he did and does the wrong thing. And in a strange way, what she does, I don't know if it's worse, but she's got more time to think about what she's doing than he does. It's a matter of seconds with the avalanche. With her thing, it's been going on for a little while. That this guy's... But it's not an avalanche. There's the time for everybody to think. It's not like she's bailing on them. They can make a decision as well. But she doesn't make sure the kids come. Yep. And there's more time because the guy stopped the bus. She's put in a similar situation. She's got even more time, a little bit more at least, and not such an urgent situation. And she doesn't think about the kids either, or him. Is it possible that's another test she's giving him? I don't think so anymore. I I, did before. If it wasn't for her performance being so convincingly afraid, because she's panicked. This isn't like when he rescues her and you can tell she's putting it on. She's a controlled person, but she's not very good at faking it, right? I don't think it's really a voluntary thing that she's doing, but... We've talked about Tomas's transformation in this film. Ebba, to me, is actually a more interesting character. The subtlety of her performance is like a masterpiece. I'm always going to be inclined to be on her side just because she's the woman. But I also think that she's right. I love how the film doesn't make her a martyr or a saint. She is wrong sometimes, and I think she's wrong at the end of the film. And the rigidity and the rage, that doesn't do her any favors. She's a woman who always puts her family first. And I think she thought... It was going to get her something. I think she thought there would be a reward. I think she thought in exchange for everything she's done, this man would save her in an avalanche, right? In exchange for putting up with his affairs and all of his other shortcomings, that he wouldn't let her down when it mattered. And then what does she do for the rest of the film? She just seeds. She goes off by herself. There's a beautiful scene where she's skiing by herself. She's she's skiing skiing and then peeing. (laughs) Skiing and then peeing in the woods. 
and she sees them. She has her bare exposed ass sitting out there in the snow, but she doesn't pull up her pants. She's so afraid they'll even hear her. She's just standing there frozen. She needs that time alone. Because she needs that time alone, and she needs that time away from them. And this is a woman who doesn't do anything away from her family, away from her kids, her whole thing. So what conclusions does she draw from all the processing that she does for these many days of just thinking? I think she comes to the conclusion that it's been a mistake to be so selfless. And then when she's on the bus, what's the new thing in her head? It's my turn to be selfish. It's my turn to let him worry about the goddamn kids. I'm getting off the bus. Will the kids be okay? Let it be his problem. It's his turn. I've done everything else. Pretty risky test. Oh, but I don't even think it's intentional. Plus, it's not the same as an avalanche, right? Even if they stayed on the bus, chances are they would probably be fine. But I think the whole theme of the movie, though, in the end, is that he fails in a crisis and so does she. She's been judging him for, what's it, about an hour and 40 minutes probably of screen time. And then she fucking fails. Not worse, I guess, but she fails too. I guess it's human nature. And if you notice, when they're all walking at the end, she asks Matt to pick up Vera to carry her. Doesn't ask her husband, but the husband does have the son by his hand. So that's not such a big deal. And Matt is a family friend. It's not just some stranger. Okay, fine. She's not literally alone, but she in a way is alone. Because she's enjoying a little independence. I guess that's it, yeah. But she's not really, even then, with the cold light of day, realizing, oh, I should maybe take care of the daughter or the son or be with my husband or whatever. She's walking on her own, basically. She's a new woman. And I read, I didn't see it, but I read on, I guess, Wikipedia, that Fanny is separate from Matt's because of the big fight. She's saying, you do the same thing he would in a crisis when they're having wine. And clearly, Ebba said way too much. Brings up the phone to show what really happened and everything. Matt does the thing a lot of guys would do, which is, well, people fail in crises, and you mentioned he's this before. He's sticking up for his bro. And know? they are friends from before, yeah. So he's sticking yeah. up for somebody he actually knows from before, not just a guy he met and trying to stick up for a fellow dude. But if I'm right about that, that I read that online, that Fanny's far away from Matt's, she's projecting something onto him he hasn't even done wrong. But you do the same thing, and they fight all night long. They show the card many times in the movie, day two, day three. I think it's day four. So they show the card after they've been fighting, but they're still fighting. Yeah. Because they've been fighting all night. <laughs> Their boyfriend, girlfriend, he doesn't really owe her that much. And she's accusing him of doing something that he didn't do. His friend did. But I saw this in the theater. And when the lights finally go out and she's like, oh, I know why your wife divorced you now. And he goes, what? The biggest laugh line of the yeah. movie that has some pretty good jokes in it. But the laugh that got out of the audience was massive because everybody was like, girl, what are you doing? <laughs> You're done for. You said that's why your wife divorced you? I think generally speaking, when couples were to witness another couple having an argument, when they discuss it, if they discuss it later on that night or the next day or something, it's not always going to be true. But generally speaking, the guy's going to sympathize with the guy and the woman's going to sympathize with the woman. Who do you sympathize with in this couple? I sympathize with them only because of what I said maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes ago, mm-hmm. that I don't know that I'd do any different. I hope I would do different. I'd want to try to save everybody I could save there, but I don't know that I would. And I have the evidence that I failed with our dog, but then maybe it wasn't going to fail. Nothing happened with the whole softball thing. Would I defend you against anything? I'd like to think so. Take me rather than my wife. I'd give that in a second. But it's easy to say all that now, and so many guys would. Well, I would always defend my family. How do you know? Okay, so talk about how you interpret the way masculinity is portrayed in this film. He's a phony. That's part of the problem. I said it before. I don't think I'd lie about it. He's lying to himself and to her. And for days... They're only there for a few more days. They're there for, I think, five days total, or maybe it's four. But for two or three days, he's completely lying and keeps bringing up the word perception. It's your perception that I did these things, your perception, until he sees the video and still denies it, but it's a lot harder to deny when you actually see the fact his phone's running away and he's holding the phone, so how can you say you're not running away? I love his friendship with Matt's. I love the day he spends with Matt's where Matt's knows he did wrong, but he still just loves his bud. Mm-hmm. And he's just doing everything he knows how to make him feel better. Primal scream. He's philosophizing about human nature. None of us know what we would do. Da, da, da. And trying to like diffuse the situation and defend him to Ebba. Everybody loves to talk about this scene. They're sitting having a beer mm-hmm. on the outside. And this woman comes up to them and says, my friend thinks you're the hottest guy in the bar. And then... He's a handsome man, too. And he's just, ooh, feeling himself. Like, oh, he's getting his groove back in that moment. Got a back now. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, women still want me. I'm cool, I'm cool. And then she comes back a minute later and goes, I'm sorry, I met someone else. She met <laughs> someone else. I got the wrong guy. And what does Matt do? 
He stands up and he starts yelling at her. Are you making fun of us? You just having a laugh? This other guy comes in and is like, hey, 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 what's your problem? They almost have a fight with this total stranger Mm -hmm. who doesn't even know what's going on. And then Tomas has to, like, diffuse the whole thing. The cringe factor is so painful. And apparently that actually happened to Osteland. He was Tomas. He was either Tomas or his buddy was Tomas. But that actually happened to them. He's a handsome enough guy that if somebody said that to him, you'd be like, yeah, yeah, I can buy it. But he's also not the hottest guy in the room. He's not Pitt in his prime. No, no. Movie does start off, though, with the photo of the happy family on the slopes. And they're a beautiful family, of course. The word I kept coming up with when I was thinking about Lisa Lovin Kongsley, who plays Ebba, is sleek. She's mm-hmm. very sleek. I forgot we see her topless, at least, towards the end. That was a nice little moment as well. But I didn't even need to see that. You see her nipples plenty of time. She's barely wearing... Well, she's wearing clothes. It's not like she's scandalizing her children. They're also European, so it's not quite so chaste or whatever you want to call it, like in our culture. There's that great shot. I think some of the posters have this where the four of them are laying in bed together. And then above them in this poster, they photoshopped it, of course, is the avalanche. Some of the poster shots are just them at lunch, him running away. I think that's the one you see in IMDb I'm looking at today as we record. But I've seen posters of them laying in bed and wearing, not the same, but very similar long johns type of thing. It's not sexy because it's four people and two of them are children. But they're all touching each other. They're having like a little It's a very intimate thing for sure. They just got there and they're resting because they just had a travel day. And that's before the avalanche. Yes. And that shot, if it's not a direct copy of an Ikea catalog, and I say Ikea because he's Swedish, (laughs) right? Common sense. Doesn't it look like exactly the style? You have this attractive family dressed in identical clothes. They at least look like they're from a catalog. Mm -hmm. But honestly, they look like a picture from an Ikea catalog. And sleeping together. perfect family. Whoever sleeps together. (laughs) Yeah, they start with the photographer giving them orders of how to appear like a perfect family. And then we see this image of them as this picture-perfect catalog family. Before, of course, everything falls apart. Which is day two. And the controlled explosions you hear over and over again. The movie starts with that. When they're getting the picture taken, you hear that going on because that's setting up, what, I guess, deliberate avalanches to make better snow. Yeah, it's part of the audioscape that is really well used to create tension. The look is sterile. There's the snow everywhere, of course, which is beautiful, but just so perfectly clean. And there's this soulless, minimalist resort. The camera rarely moves. Most of the shots are static or slow moves. There's lots of long takes, especially on those awkward moments. I noticed that, too. Yeah, it's merciless. The camera does not look away. Oslin said that he would only do one camera setup a day. The idea was, instead of taking the time to do multiple setups... I take the time to do multiple takes, and he said he averaged about 40 takes per scene Mm -hmm. to get the performance that he wanted to make sure that it was perfect. He's like, I care what's in front of the camera. I don't care as much where the camera is. And you couldn't obviously see his choice play out here. But those long takes, I think, beautifully build the tension. Moving the camera's great. It doesn't have to happen, Yeah, but especially with cringe. He doesn't let you look away. So it's a great strategy to make his audience uncomfortable, which is clearly his goal. And then from the beginning, the soundtrack has those cannons. They stress you out a little bit. And that beautiful Vivaldi song. It's Vivaldi's Summer from the Four Seasons. Summer Concerto. Which he uses over and over again. And it dun, 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 Yeah, yeah. Dun, 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 a real tension builder. Hmm. Back to the avalanche for a second. One of the key points she makes over and over again is that he grabs his gloves and his phone. Thinking of the phone... Well, that's actually more relevant now because... He was already in his hands, at least. He was filming Mm. the avalanche. Matt's is the one who says later on, well, but if they get covered in an avalanche, you get away so you can come back and dig them out. That's one of his excuses (laughs) Talk about an excuse, yeah. But he has the gloves so he can dig them out. Yeah. (laughs) Think of the gloves and the phone. The phone thing, I guess in our current era, 10 years later, we have to get because we're all obsessed with our phones now. He's got to call for help. (sighs) Matt and Fanny breathe so much fresh air into this film when they come in. First, they just show up with their big hair. Just the look of them. He looks like Tormund from Game of Thrones. Yeah, he looks... And she has this beautiful, big, curly hair and this cherubic face. They change the whole vibe instantly, the way that they are. And they're cute, but they wouldn't be in a magazine the way that the family would. 
Totally, yeah. And also, he is in, meaning Hibju, is in the remake. Are they playing the exact same character? No, no, different character. Oh, he runs the ski shop or something like that? They make some different choices in the remake. Oh, because they need an English-speaking actor, I guess, because it's English people. He can speak English. I mean, he speaks English in Game of Thrones. Oh, you're right, he does, doesn't he? That's true. Yeah. No, no, he's an English-speaking character, but he's one of the employees at the ski resort, a character that doesn't exist in Force Majeure. The movie's so different downhill. It's shorter, too, as I recall. Because they probably just don't let those scenes drag out the way Oslin does. Yeah. I don't like the way he tells a story. I feel like he could either tighten stuff up or get to the point quicker. The Square is a long movie, isn't it? It's a long movie with a lot of these vignettes that... Has your favorite scene of the my, last 10 years. Honest to God. The 2010s. He said that in every single movie, in every scene in every movie that he makes, he's trying to show people saving face. That's a perfect encapsulation of that scene in the square. And if you've seen the square, you automatically know what scene I'm talking about. But also on the poster cover is a scene of a performance art performance. (laughs) Terry Notary's become big in the motion capture game. Right. Of a guy pretending to be an ape during a big, very fancy gala. You can watch it on on YouTube. YouTube. The Square. You don't need any context to watch it. And there are many movies, or at least two movies, because there's a documentary called The Square. But look for, I guess, The Square, Ruben Oslin. I forget the year right now. Yeah, so you've got the running from the avalanche in this movie. That was, I think, a couple years later, The Square, or around the same time. Anyway, with that performance you're talking about with Terry Notary. And then in Triangle of Sadness, I guess the big thing is just the long puking sequence. Because a lot of things happen in that movie. The last act in that movie, you do not know where it's going to go. That's the one that got the Best Picture nomination last year, yes, I think, yes. and Best Director Best for him. Director. Yeah, right, because he was nominated for Best Director and Best Screenplay. He mm-hmm. wasn't a producer. He would have had three nominations like so many people get these days as directors. They're often the writers, the producers, and the directors. He wasn't the producer on that film. The weakest of his three, I wasn't planning to watch it because I want to see people puking forever and ever. You were going to watch it on your own. And then it got the nominations. I thought, well, i got to watch it now. I liked it more than I thought I would. And at least that was justified. But I guess that's the big moment in that movie. Although the third act really changes everything and it's a whole different movie. It's not a bad one. I actually would give it probably three stars. The Square, I guess I would too. But now seeing this twice especially, and I would have said this anyway, this is easily the best of the three movies he's made. Is it only three he's made in total? I think it is. Or at least three major ones. It's the most straightforward, least ambitious it's such a small story that he just drags out to two hours because he lets these moments breathe so much. Yeah. But I think sticking with this family and their friends, as opposed to both the square and triangle of sadness, where you have all these B plots, that right. take up a lot of Bigger air in the room. Too. Yeah. I'm an editor, so I would love to just get in there and... Redo them now for all these years? <laughs> or months in the case of Triangle of Sadness? Yeah, yeah. I is can't it help myself. Charlotte, who's the friend who talks about fucking around? And her husband yes. does too. So that's Karen Mirenberg faber She's the one that has a few different scenes. She's with Brady Corbett, so she probably boned him later that night. They have the dinner. That's when Ebba first says, but eh, he ran away, but that's not that big a deal at that point. They're awkward. They're speaking a different language. It's her first attempt to get him to talk about it. Right. They're speaking in Swedish, wherever language that Charlotte doesn't understand. And of course, Brady Corbett doesn't understand anything they're saying if it's any of the other languages that's not English. So there's a bit of an awkwardness there, but it's way worse with Matt and Fanny, of course. But then we see Charlotte later on. I think it's Charlotte. Maybe I have the wrong name. Yeah, it's Charlotte. It's Charlotte. Okay. Who talks about fucking around with another guy at this resort, but then the husband does the same thing. Charlotte is interesting. She's there to provide this counterexample to the, quote, proper family unit. She doesn't follow the rules. She does what she wants. She creates her life on her own terms. She doesn't feel bad at all. She's very independent and autonomous and just seeks joy and doesn't care. She knows her family works. She doesn't need society to accept it. She seems completely above it all. She doesn't get bent out of shape when Ebba tries to shame her. Ebba is rude to her. When I say Ebba has flaws, this scene really points it out. Very judgmental. Judgmental and clearly Jealous. Yes. Maybe not she jealous, is jealous of exactly what she's doing, but jealous that she has the freedom and autonomy to do whatever she wants, something that she just doesn't think she even has the capability of doing. And this is why I'm saying when she gets off that bus, maybe there's a part of her that's like, fuck it, I'm going to be like Charlotte. Charlotte actually seems like the more evolved person. Yeah. And then she also gives the film this tool to teach us about Ebba. Ebba can't express this anger and judgment towards Tomas. Or accept, and Charlotte can accept. Yes. So she's so mad, but she can't do this in front of her kids. She can't do this to Tomas, but she can express it to Charlotte, who just takes it. She doesn't care. She knows, well, we all should know, that when Ebba judges her, she's telling on herself. Oh, yeah, clearly. That she's this mad, especially. And Tomas, like you said, also unfaithful. So maybe her anger at Charlotte isn't anger at Tomas for cheating on her, which we learn later she knows. 
was happening. But it makes you wonder if someone were to say, well, I guess Tomas were to say, lie detector test me right now. You can fuck around with at least one guy and that's fine. That's your hall pass. Or maybe a few guys. And she could believe him. Maybe she still doesn't really want to. So she's mad that if I had that chance, I would do it. But I can't do it at the same point. So I don't know if I'm saying this right, but Johannes Kunki does play Tomas. He was in The House That Jack Built, which is a Matt Dillon film by Lars von Trier. So maybe that's not technically an American film, but I think it is with Matt Dillon in it. Anyway, he's mostly been in non-American movies. Not that this is American, but you think maybe with his looks and this performance and everything else, it might have translated into a Hollywood career, but it didn't really. Lisa Levin Kongsley was in some Hollywood films, quite a few of them, because she's in Wonder Woman. She's one of the Amazons. So she's in the original Wonder Woman, the Snyder Cut. And she is a very lovely woman. It's not like she's really truly made up either. She still looks so great. Clara and Vincent Wedergren do play the kids. Harry and Vera. So Vera is the older one, I guess, right? Yeah, she's older. Mm -hmm. That's right. This is the only movie that either one of these two ever made. They must be brother and sister. I couldn't find absolute evidence of that, but they must be with that same last name. They look so much alike. They've both done a few TV things, but that is about all for their careers. We mentioned Hivju was in Downhill, but also Cocaine Bear, last year's weirdo. Should have been better movie, but I did basically enjoy it, I guess. And his best role, and probably will always be his best role. Well, then again, he's not dead yet. He can make a lot of great things, but Tormund in Game of Thrones. And Fanny Metellius was only in one other movie, also did quite a few things on TV. When we do these movies from other countries, a lot of times I burn through the cast list so fast because they didn't do things we really recognize. Maybe it's a lot of things other people recognize in Sweden. They're probably famous in Sweden. But I don't recognize these titles. Ruben Ostlund. We already talked about The Square and Triangle of Sadness. He directed one before and one after this movie. Wait, The Square came after this. Yep. So both were after this then. He directed another film before this. There were eight producers on this movie. Jessica Ask, so A-S-K, who's a prolific producer. I didn't write down her credits. There's a lot of them, though. Philippe Bobet, or Bobet, I don't know if it's B-O-B-E-R. That's the spelling. Worked on these big three for Oastland. Marie K-J-E-L-L-S-O-N, anyway, did this and that. And Eric Hemendorf also worked on these big three. The Square, Force Majeure, and Triangle of Sadness. The film was 235 to 1. We saw it on Canopy for free. Cinematographer Frederick Wenzel shot Oslin's Big Three. The editors were Oslin himself and Jacob Seche, maybe, or Secher, S-E-C-H-E-R. Schulzinger cut the Big Three. And the composer Ola Flotum, or Flotum, didn't work with Oslin again that I could see, but did do the music for The Worst Person in the World, which is also, I think, on Canopy, by the and way. A wonderful movie. Really I good love film, that yeah. film. Yeah. So what do you think? Well, I guess we've already said, but the look, the cutting, and the music. Oh, I love everything about it. Above everything, it has a really great, cohesive vision. I would say so, too. What happens next? Well, since Saving Her in the Fog was just a stunt she pulled, and maybe they pulled, but at least she did, to placate his ego, Tomas decides to pay for someone to create a fake disaster, and this time he does save the family. Only in an ironic touch, this time Tomas dies. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, no, don't go. <laughs> Do I get his pension? <laughs> Here's a the question cool. for what happens next. Do they stay married? I think so. I don't. Well, the fact that she's walking somewhat on her own and she did try to bail on the whole family, despite the fact that what was going on as bad as that bus driver was, was not an emergency. I don't think so anyway. Makes you wonder. But I can also see how people, when they get back home, in some ways it's that what happens on vacation stays on vacation. People always think of that being a sex thing. But in this case, it could be we had a bad experience, but I can move on from it. Partly because he did apologize finally. He did grovel, which she wanted him to do, and he did it. And she maybe is accepting this for the sake of the kids and also for herself. She may not be happy, but she also, let's not forget, wants the money that he's obviously bringing in, that they went on this vacation. She wants the dollars. I'm we cynical. We don't know that. You're making that assumption. For all okay. we know, she's an heiress. This whole thing's an assumption. Wealthy. Yeah, yeah. I think either he changes, he truly becomes a different man after this experience, or it's just a matter of time before she leaves him. What's the last thing he does? I don't smoke to some stranger, then does take the cigarette, and the son asks him, do you smoke? He says, yes, I smoke. He's honest with his son. So okay. he is changed. It's an optimism. But we never see him smoke in the movies, though. But then he changes so. in a worse way. You're right. <laughs> Don't take up smoking. <laughs> That's not the kind of change Ebba wants to see either. She doesn't want to start smoking in front of the children. But it could be the, honesty the seed the of something. Exactly. The honesty is like, i got to stop pretending I'm someone I'm not. And that starts with me just telling my son that I smoke. Is it right? No. But I do. I smoke. But you're right. It's the first time you see him smoke in the film. I think if I was a parent, I'd be too honest with them. <laughs> yeah, you would. 
Last thoughts on your second movie? Third, third time. Oh, my second movie of Second seven. movie of this month. Yeah. yeah, I don't have a calendar yet for the year on January 4th to look at my little layout. Well, yes, this is the second movie that you chose for the month of ninth annual. Your last thoughts on it. I mean, I've been dying to cover this film for the past nine and a half years. So thrilled to talk about it. And I feel like this podcast, we're stopping it because we have to, but we're probably going to keep talking about it for the rest of the night on and off. And this we does, could make this a three-hour podcast. There's this so much meat on this bone. does feel like an argue-in-the-lobby type movie, especially amongst couples. Whether oh, my they're God, yes. just dating, like Matt's and Fanny, or married for however many years. It's obviously quite a few years, like Ebba and Tomas. Yeah, I've seen it three times, and it really does keep revealing more angles of itself to me every time. I just think it's a wonderful film. I love it so much. I think it's fascinating. You're a bigger fan than I am, but I liked it a lot more this time around. And I liked it fine the first time. I'm not that far behind you in your fandom, I don't think, now, though. In seven days, we'll continue the month of Bev. We'll stay in Europe, only this time the glamour will happen in warm locales. It's Matt, Jude, Gwyneth, and friends, and Anthony Mangella the talented Mr. Ripley. Two of those friends I didn't just mention are maybe the most talented ones in the whole cast, Kate Blanchett and Philip Seymour Hoffman. What a cast. The coming attractions trivia for The Talented Mr. Ripley. Patricia Highsmith's story of The Talented Mr. Ripley has been adapted into a movie several times. Who are the two actors who played Ripley since Matt Damon starred in Anthony Mangella's 1999 version that we will cover next week? So for the answer to that question, check out next week's podcast about the talented Mr. Ripley. You already know how to find us, but let me remind you to favorite or subscribe wherever you listen, which is also where you can find our archive of hundreds of episodes that are available for free. And while you're there, leave us a rating and a review. It's a great way to support the podcast. We're both on Twitter. I'm at Bev Ellis Ellis and Ryan is at MovieFiend51. Or you can reach us by email, have you ever seen podcast at gmail.com. You can also find our podcast on YouTube. Our channel is at H-Y-E-S Ellis. And to enjoy freshly roasted premium coffee delivered straight to you in Canada or the U.S., please go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S and enjoy a 20% discount. Since Ebba went on to be an Amazonian in the Wonder Woman movies, maybe she kicks his motherfucking ass <laughs> and maybe even kills him. Well, I got my gloves. I got my phone. I'm out of here. Bye. <laughs> Close. And cut.